What's going on, y'all? We are doing a podcast. Let's go. Episode one of my podcast, Flow State. I'm so excited to be doing this. We're going to answer some questions from the community. I'm going to react to some freestyles that were submitted by the fans, and then I'll close it out with a freestyle of my own. Hope y'all enjoy. Let's go. This is for my Flow State. Yeah, flow state. Add it. Add it. Add it. Yeah. Count we back at it. Add it. Ain't it crazy how the mind works magic. Add it. We'll show you the method behind the madness, because this is for my Flow State. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to the very first episode of my podcast, Flow State. Super stoked to be doing this. I've been wanting to do a podcast for a long, long time. And we've been busy. We've been on the road and traveling all over, touring and all that fun stuff. But uh, now that I'm back home in LA, I finally have the time to uh, sit down and get started with this podcast. So I'm super, super excited to be doing this. You know, I kind of want to have the opportunity to open up a little bit more, share some more of my thoughts and ideas with my audience, um, share a little bit more of my personality, you know, obviously a lot of my thoughts and ideas and, and personality traits come through when I'm freestyling, but I feel like up to this point, you know, when I'm communicating with my audience, it's usually me freestyling at you guys or, or for you guys uh, via the YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to be a guest on some really fun podcasts and, um, you know, that's been really great. And, and just based on the comments that come through from the community, anytime I'm on somebody else's podcast, a lot of times it's things like, oh, it's so refreshing to hear Harry Mack talk about the process or, oh, it's so great to hear you talk about, you know, overcoming fear and insecurity and, and uh, whatever it is that, that we get into on the podcast that I've been lucky enough to be a guest on. And so I figured, um, you know, it'd be, it'd be a good idea to start my own podcast and be able to share some of that directly with the audience. So uh, I'm really, really excited about this. Like I said, I've wanted to do it for a long time, uh, but we've been busy out on tour. Speaking of, the Odyssey tour was an absolute blast. Shout out to anybody and everybody that got to come out and rock with us on tour. Um, biggest shows I've ever done in terms of audience size, biggest venues, um, and biggest in terms of production as well. So, um, Shout out to uh, my DJ, Sir Jazz. Shout out to my whole team. We all get to go out on the road and travel together. And uh, it's a really, really beautiful family experience. You know, we're, we're really, uh, you know, we're living together for months at a time. And we're having all these super enriching life experiences together, traveling from place to place. Uh, Odyssey Tour was both, you know, the U.S. and Europe. And uh, man, I just feel like it's such a beautiful thing. You know, it's such a cool part of this career path that I get to travel around the world with some of my best friends and form these core memories with, you know, people that I really love and care about. And, you know, we all get to work towards this sort of common goal of putting on these dope shows. Uh, And again, shout out to anybody that got to make it out to a show. If you didn't get to make it out because we didn't come anywhere near where you live or just didn't work out this time, um, you know, hopefully we can connect with y'all next time. But um, the tour was a huge success and and, uh, just a insane experience it's kind of difficult to actually put into words Uh, but some of the content that will come out will hopefully show you guys uh, what really went down out there Um, but yeah now that we're back home I'm very very excited for 2024 Um, I'm really excited to sort of explore some new terrain you know as an artist to challenge myself a little bit hopefully break out of my comfort zone And I don't know exactly what that looks like, if I'm being completely honest with you guys. I want to experiment. I want to try some new things. Uh, Many of you, you know, who are are fans of me and what I do uh, probably saw the post where I said I was going to take a break from uh, creating Omegle Bars um, after episode 100. And actually, that's something that we should talk about right off the bat. The just mind-blowing timing of all of that. I have to address this because (laughs) a lot of people have been DMing me or reaching out or trying to understand how the stars aligned in in the way that they did. And to be honest with you, I'm still um, baffled by it. Uh, So yeah, I guess it was a few weeks back that I announced that I was going to be taking a break from Omegle content after episode 100. And of course, I knew that we had a super, super special episode for episode 100 um, because we'd been working on it for a long time. We were sort of putting the the best clips, not necessarily the best clips, yes, the best clips, but also the ones that play the best with each other. Um, We'd been kind of grouping them from my various Omegle sessions uh, for several months. So, you know, we knew this landmark um, episode 100 was on the horizon and we wanted to make it as dope as possible for the fans. So I knew that. And while we were on tour, I sort of realized that I, I had sort of given all that I can give at this point to that specific mode of creating. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's like, like I said in the caption when I posted, if anybody uh, got a chance to read that, it's like, you know, I rapped fast, I rapped slow, I got serious, I got deep, uh, I also got silly, I made people laugh, I made people cry, I learned so much through the process. And uh, by the way, shout out to everybody that supported the Omegle Bars series because it's been such an enriching uh, experience for me to be able to make that content. And uh, it's so beautiful what it, what it turned out to be. I had no idea it would turn out to be what it in fact did turn out to be. Um, so super, super important thing for me. But uh, yeah, I realized on tour that I've, I've given all that I can at this time to that mode. And so it's time to explore some new horizons. It's time to evolve. Um, it's time to see what else might be out there for me as a creator. Um, so I made my little announcement. Okay, we're going to pause after episode 100. Episode 100 drops. Um, you know, big celebration on, on my side. Okay, dope. We got episode 100 out. The, the fans seem to be digging it. And then I think it was two days later, like or, or a day and a half later, it was in our team Discord, actually, where we like do all our admin stuff. Somebody said, uh, wow, uh, can't believe the timing of this. And they, they posted the article that said that the Omegle website was shut down permanently. Uh, crazy, crazy timing. Two days after episode 100 drops, the website shuts down forever. Um, a lot of conspiracies are circulating. A lot of people are wondering, you know, was I in contact with the, the guy that runs Omegle? Shout out to him. <laughs> don't actually know his name, but shout out to him. Um, no, I was not in contact with him. As you can tell, I don't even know the guy's name, but, uh, yeah, no, it's just, a, it's a crazy aligning of events. The timing is spooky, spooky timing. Um, uh, but you know, I think, um, for me, I've always really uh, felt like it's important to trust my intuition, you know, and uh, I get this sort of spidey sense about things. Sometimes it's weird. Um, people that I know in, in uh, you know, in my life have pointed out that, you know, I'll get this sort of uh, this sense about things and then and then hopefully I act on it because I find that usually when I act on the spidey sense, that's almost always the right thing to have done. Uh, even if it's scary or confusing at the time, it, it usually works out for the better. And it's when I kind of don't trust the gut instinct and overthink it and, and, you know, say, oh, well, that can't be right. You know, that's too crazy. Um, that's when it usually doesn't go as smoothly. So this was just another instance of me sort of getting a, a, a spidey sense and acting on it. And, um, I will say, I'm glad that I made the post that I wanted to make the creative leap when I did, because I, I do think that if, uh, you know, if Omegle had shut down and then I said, I'm excited to explore new creative terrain, nobody would have believed me. They would have been like, yeah, yeah, okay, man. Yeah, you want to explore new creative terrain, i.e. Omegle shut down and now you have no idea what the hell you're going to make. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, the timing of it is, is absolutely bizarre. Um, and actually the guy that made the site, I don't know if it's still up, but for a while there was like this long form essay explaining why, uh, the site shut down. That was kind of interesting. I didn't read the whole thing, but I, I skimmed through some of it and, and, um, uh, interesting stuff, crazy times, but, uh, yes, onward and upward for us here, man. I'm, I'm very excited to keep exploring. I'm very excited to figure out what the next wave of content is going to look like and feel like and sound like. And, uh, I'm super grateful to all of you, all the fans and all the supporters and everybody watching this. And I'm excited for us to kind of go on that journey together and, uh, and grow and evolve, man. Cause that's what it's all about in 2024. And, uh, of course this podcast is one of the things I'm most excited about. By the way, we got my man Sam producing behind the scenes right now. How you feeling, Sam? What up, Mac? Welcome to your pod. Thank you. Excited to be here. Uh, yeah, man. How you feeling? Feeling good, man. So. Yeah. We uh, grabbed some questions from a lot of fans if you want to jump into those. Hell yeah. Yeah, let's do it, man. Let's do it. Definitely. Um, okay, so we're going to take some questions from the community. Uh, we reached out on YouTube community. We also reached out on the Patreon. Shout out to the Patreon fam. Uh, for future episodes, if you want your questions to be considered for the podcast, uh, hit up harrymacofficial.com slash flowstatepod. We have a page set up right now where you can submit your questions for future episodes. And uh, we're going to take some of those and, and uh, answer them for future episodes. So with that being said, let's dive right in. First question comes from Joshua Jerome 553. Joshua says, I'm going to ask a question we ask a lot, but rarely want a genuine answer. How are you, Harry? Wow. That's fascinating. I'm going to ask a question we ask a lot, but rarely want a genuine answer. That part's interesting to me. Um, how are you, Harry? I'm doing great, man. I'm really doing good. Uh, you know, um, I'm... How should I say? I'm in an interesting frame of mind right now as a creative, 
because... You know, Omegle Bars, the series, has been such a huge part of my identity as a creator for the last several years. And again, it's been so beautiful to see sort of the progress and growth of that series in particular. And so to make the decision to put that on hold and to move on to explore other things is inspiring and exciting, but um, it's also a little terrifying. You know, it's a little scary at times to uh, kind of pull the rug out from underneath everything that I'm, that I'm doing and say, we're going to explore something new. Um, but you know, I think it's necessary. So I'm kind of enjoying that sort of uh, space that I'm in right now, creatively where I'm figuring it out. And, uh, I think every time that I look back on moments where I've evolved as a human being, it's been when I've sort of, uh, rip the rug out from underneath everything you know it's like one of my favorite sayings is leap in the net will appear and so it's those moments when i finally decide to leap and uh, you know you have to have faith right and uh, sometimes things seem crazy but when you get the feeling that it's the right thing and it's what's needed for you to grow you go for it so i'm kind of in that space right now man excited and a little bit nervous but mostly excited um and uh yeah so that's cool i'm also you know i'm back from tour which is really interesting um because tour is such a unnatural way of living like it's such an insane lifestyle it doesn't really make sense i mean i think i've been on over a hundred flights in the last couple years for one thing um more than that probably like 150 flights both tours combined i don't know how many flights (laughs) so many flights uh i've stayed in so many airbnbs and hotels Um, it's a really crazy thing to be traveling every other day to a new city, um, in Europe, a whole new country often. And, um, you know, to, to not even to mention, obviously putting on these massive shows that we put on and hopping out there on stage in front of 2000 people and, and, um, you know, performing an improvised show. Of course, that's a crazy uh, endeavor in and of itself, but it's almost like everything else that has to happen just to allow me to actually get to the stage to perform for the audience that makes it so crazy. And um, it's really an adrenaline fueled thing. You know, um, every time before we leave for the tour, like in the in the days leading up to it, my mind is so scrambled. You know, I'm like, what is going to happen? How is this? How is any of this possible? How are we going to do any of this? It doesn't seem feasible that we're actually going to go do 30 shows in a row, you know, or whatever it is um, in, in a few months. And, um, you know, it's, it's crazy and you get the nerves and all that. And then it's kind of like you just dive in, you know, the day comes, you get on the first flight and it starts and your body's like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Why is this happening? Why am I traveling so much? And then you, you know, you do the first show, massive adrenaline boost. You take the next flight, you're in the next city, next show, next flight, next city, next show. And at some point by like the third show or something like that, I feel like your mind and your body kind of just adapt to this new lifestyle out of necessity because you have to, uh, (laughs) you have to survive it, you know, Uh, you have to embrace it and uh, survive it is a weird word that makes it sound like it's something that you don't want to be doing. Obviously it's, it's incredibly fulfilling and fun, but it's so exhausting, you know, in many ways. And it's so demanding, I should say. That's really the best word for it. It's taxing. It requires all the energy that, that I have um, to be able to pull it off. So uh, it's fueled by adrenaline and you don't really notice it. You know, the adrenaline is just like, oh yeah, this is fine. This is what you do now. You just, every other day, you just fly to a new country and you just perform in front of 1,500 or 2,000 people and that's that. Uh, <laughs> and so that happens for a while. And so when you get back home, like when I get back to Los Angeles, the first couple of weeks are really weird. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know if people watching can relate, but it's like, if you get really, really excited for something like a holiday, maybe, um, that you really enjoy or, or some like date that you've had planned for a while where you're like catching up with all your old friends or whatever it is, you're like, Oh, this thing is going to come and it's going to be so great. And you get really excited for it. And then the thing happens and it's so great and it's so exciting and it's, it's whatever, it's all that. And then the next day, like you wake up and you feel down, you know, or you feel kind of low or, or like, um, you know, you just feel a little sad, like, Oh wait, there's this emptiness that comes after it because you were so looking forward to that thing for so long. And I feel like my first couple of weeks back home from tour has a similar sort of vibe to it where it's not like I'm like deeply depressed or anything like that, but I'm just feeling a little like, eh, what am I supposed to do now? 
you know? And I think it's this come down from the adrenaline. It's like the first night that I crash back in my bed in Los Angeles, I sleep for like, you know, 12 or 15 hours or something like that. And there's a lot of recovery that has to happen physically and mentally and all that adrenaline is leaving your system. And so, you, you know, I feel kind of drained, a little bit sluggish and a little bit like, I don't know what my purpose is at that exact moment because tour as crazy as it is, it, it's, it focuses me as an artist because there's just one clear objective the whole time. It's like all these flights and all these Airbnbs and all this planning and all these rehearsals and sound checks. It's all about one thing for the whole team. It unifies us as a team and it focuses me as an artist. Get to the show and kill the show. That's it. Um, because these people have paid real money to be at this show. They're my fans. Some of these people have traveled from so far, you know, and I really feel like it's my duty as an artist to rise to the occasion and do the best fucking show I can do every single night, no matter how tired I am or, or how, you know, stressful it might be getting there. None of that matters. When the show comes, uh, I have to rise to that occasion and give my all. And I really do, you know, leave it all out on the stage. Um, but you know, that's the sole focus of the entire tour. You know, um, yes, we're recording content and yes, we're, you know, we're dropping content the whole time and staying active. But, um, for me personally, it's like, Hey, just make sure you can get to that stage and rock that show. And it's such a clear purpose. And it's like, not only do I know what my purpose is, but every night it's validated by all the fans packed into the venue, like, yeah, woo, you know, screaming out and all that. And, and, uh, that's a crazy element of it too. It's so, there's so much, um, positive feedback from the audience telling me like, yes, you are doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And we love it, you know, uh, hopefully, um, uh, that's been the experience so far, which is beautiful. Shout out to all the fans. But, um, yeah, so, so coming down from that is challenging at times for the first couple of weeks, but now I've been home from tour for, I don't know how long month and a month and a half or something, something like that. Something like yeah. that. Uh, yeah, we've been home for a little while. So, um, I'm good now. I'm feeling all the relaxation that I'm that I should be feeling not being on the road. I'm starting to feel creative again. Um, like I want to start making content and, and recording music and um, doing all the things that are kind of challenging to do when we're on the road. Now I have the space to do them. So, uh, yeah, shout out to Joshua Jerome asking how I'm doing. I'm doing great, man. I'm excited to be back. I'm feeling grounded. Nice. So it's a little tough to decompress after tour and yeah, kind of switch up two completely different routines. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It feels very binary. It's like you're on the road killing the shows and that's all that matters or you're at home and there's a million different things to juggle. You know? And that's sort of the irony of it. In many ways, it's more challenging to be home. It's almost it's almost easier to be on the road, even though it's all the travel and it's exhausting and it's stressful and, you know, all that. And you really don't feel grounded at all. Um, but you are grounded in the fact that there's only one objective. And when I'm home, there's a million different things I could be doing, you know, and there's a million different things that I need to be doing. You know, I'm doing live streams. I'm, I'm doing, you know, content for the channel. I'm doing content for the Patreon and th all things that I love to do, by the way. But to, to decide which one to do at any given moment, uh, can be challenging for me. So the structure of tour is something that my mind uh, really benefits from. So yeah, yeah, it's a challenge. Makes sense. Yeah. We got another one here um, from Richard E. If you want to take this one on. Yeah, let's check it out. Richard E. says, if something happened and you couldn't rap anymore, where would your soul take you next? Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> wow. It's like, um, if anyone knows DOC, the rapper who got in a car accident and then his throat box got messed up. Oh, yeah. Um, but he continued writing a lot of great records for Dr. Dre and other, other big names. But, yeah, that's crazy to imagine. If something happened and I could no longer rap, um, man, I mean, I think luckily for me, um, music has always been a part of my life in a multitude of different ways. So, you know, before I started rapping – uh, or actually right around the same time I started rapping, I started playing the drums. Um, so hopefully if I couldn't rap, I would still be able to play the drums. And I think that's what I would do. I mean, I think I would continue making music in whatever way that I could. And I think it would need to be the drums because that's really my primary instrument other than rap. And, you know, I just have this, um, like electric rhythm feeling inside my body that I've had since I was a baby. It's really crazy, it's really weird. But I have to express myself rhythmically. Like people like notice when I'm rapping, I'm always moving and doing stuff like this. And like even if I'm not rapping, I'm, I'm 
doing stuff like this, drumming on my knees, moving. Um, and it's been like that since I was little. I was a baby and I was drumming on the, you know, the tray of my high chair. Um, or, you know, I, I fell in love with some of the first music I fell in love with was like classic blues, um, like Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters. And like when that came on the radio when I was a baby, I like started vibrating and shaking my speaker and crazy shit like that. And my, my parents always acknowledged that um, I had this sort of like rhythmic expression that sort of was, was just coming out of me. And I, I still feel that way to this day. It's like I didn't. I didn't train that part, you know, I, I trained how to hone it and use it in a, in a way that sounded good to people. Uh, I had to learn how to play the drums. I had to learn how to rap. I had to learn how to freestyle. And that was a long process. And, you know, uh, I always mentioned my first freestyles weren't that great. And it was through training that they got good. But the rhythmic feeling like the, the desire to express through rhythm, I feel like I've just it was it was born into me as crazy as that sounds. So. If I couldn't rap, I'd be playing the drums. If for some reason I couldn't play the drums, I guess I'd be making beats. And um, if I couldn't do anything musical, hmm. That's what I was going to ask. Change rap to make music. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I couldn't do anything musical, hmm. That'd be a tough <laughs> one, man. That'd be a really tough one. I'd probably... Uh, Maybe I do something where I get to be in nature a lot, like, uh, you know, be a marine biologist or something like that. And I'd be stationed somewhere really dope with like beautiful views of the ocean. And I'd have like a little pod that I live in on the coast and I could go on long walks on the beach every day. And I just sort of like uh, vibe out, you know? Yeah. Just hang out with some sea turtles. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it would have to be. Um, yeah. All right. Let's see here. what we got next. We got a question from... Will a Dolphy eight four three two, or Willa Dolphy? Yeah, Willa. And we we touched on this a little bit on the first round here. Um, yeah, but um, go ahead and take a look. See if you have anything else to add here. Hmm. Okay. Let me see. Willa Dolphy eight four three two says, "Are there any trials and tribulations of being on the road and performing such high velocity shows? Does this impact your mental health in any way?" Is there a come down from the energy and how do you regulate this? Okay, great question. Um, yeah, I touched a little bit on the whole energy regulation part of it, but I will speak to um, the trials and tribulations of performing such high velocity shows. So um, the venues have gotten bigger and bigger over time. So like the first energy exchange tour, um, we were in a lot of smaller comedy clubs, um, which was dope. You know, that was a great way for us to get our foot in the door. And uh, shout out to the people at Levity Live that, that helped us put that first tour together and got us into a lot of iconic comedy clubs. Um, but usually those are like, you know, 200, 250 person rooms for the most part. And everybody's seated. It's like a dinner club vibe. And uh, so that was the first tour. And, and the stage is quite small, too. You know, there's not a whole lot of stage to work uh, as a performer. For the Odyssey tour, which is the one we just finished, all of the venues got way bigger. So now we're, we're going from like 200, 300 person rooms on the average to like everything being over a thousand people for the most part, you know, and the average being like 1500, 1700. We did the biggest show we've ever done on the Odyssey tour in London um, for 2000 people. Shout out to London. That was a crazy show. But um, as the venues got bigger, obviously the stage got a lot bigger. So there's a lot more territory for me to cover as a performer. And for me, the live show is so important. Um, I've been so inspired by like the dope artists that I've gotten to see perform live. You know, the first hip hop show I ever saw was Black Alicious, and they were famous for having an insane um, live show. Uh, I got to see The Roots multiple times, who are also like you know the best live act in hip hop. That's that was like their calling card for a long time, and still is. Um, so. To me, it's just really, really important if you're going to do it live, you have to bring it to the utmost. And so once we got on these larger stages, I didn't want to just be like standing in one spot. I wanted to make sure I was able to like cover the whole stage and talk to everybody in the venue. I really try to project as much as possible because I'm making up all of the so all of the songs live. Right. There's no songs for people to memorize in advance and sing along with. So I'm trying to project and uh, make sure that. Anybody, no matter where they're at, even if they're way in the back, I want to make sure they can hear me clearly. So I'm articulating and I'm projecting and I'm jumping around and running around this big stage. And uh, shout out to my DJ, Sir Jazz, as well. Him and I try to always bring the utmost energy. Uh, but yeah, it is very physical. So that's the big thing. That's the key word. Performing live is incredibly physical. Um, 
And the last thing I want is to be hopping around and running around on stage and then sound like I'm super winded or out of breath or you know, I can't get my lines out. I have to be really careful not to over project so that I don't lose my voice. So being a live performer like keeps me really in touch with my body um, in a whole different way where like if I was just home in Los Angeles, I could kind of like go about my business and do everything that I need to do. Um, you know, both as a, as an individual and as, you know, Harry Mack, the artist, um, without being super mindful of, you know, the physicality of the body that, you know, is, is my only vehicle to move through this universe with. Um, but on the road, I have to be aware of it. So a lot of the like routines and like healthy routines, um, that I try to adopt are really helpful. And especially leading up to the Odyssey tour, because I knew it was going to be bigger venues and bigger stages. And I knew that I was going to try to even elevate the energy uh, more than we had on the previous tour. Um, it started a few months before where I was, I, I was doing like vocal warm ups pretty much every day. Um, because the voice is obviously the whole instrument. And if I lose it, I can't perform. Um, and I'm not a classically trained vocalist, obviously. I'm self-taught. I'm a rapper, so I just jump around on stage and yell. Uh, but I've had to learn how to actually use my voice like an instrument. So I was doing warm-ups every day. Um, I started doing like way more cardio exercise. Like I, I jog. I don't know if you can even call it a run at the pace I go, but I jog. <laughs> and I don't go that far, but I, I would jog for 20 minutes most days. Um, and, you know, also like lifting. Uh, I have like dumbbells at home. And it's, it's nothing too crazy, but um exercise was just really, really critical in general so that I could feel like I was in shape by the time we hit the road. And we also had a pretty rigorous um, rehearsal schedule leading up to the tour. So for, um, I think, six weeks ahead of the ahead of leaving, um, we had multiple rehearsals every week. And we sort of built up to where the last week or two of rehearsals were as big, as loud, and theoretically as energetic as the show even though they're never actually as energetic as the show because you just can't replicate that in a in a room with seven people. Once you hop out on stage in front of 2,000 people, it's a totally different feeling. But um, we did everything that we could within our control to replicate how much energy we were going to bring on stage. So it's a very physical thing. And I will say, just to touch on... Um, you know, the, the down-regulating the energy and all that uh, once we get back from tour, I think that's another thing that I've noticed is... When I got back from tour, I kind of fell off of some of those healthy routines. Like, I'll be honest with you guys. Like, I basically, I just started exercising again, like yesterday. <laughs> uh, and it feels really good. But for the first few weeks, I was just like, ah, I don't know. Like, I, I don't. It was kind of like, ah, what's the point kind of vibe, you know, which is so rare for me. Like, I'm usually like, we're about to get out there. We're going to crush it. We're going to elevate, you know. Like, if you watch my freestyles, a lot of it is about bettering yourself you know mentally physically as a human being you know um finding the ways to be a better human you know i talk a lot about meditating i talk a lot about spreading kindness i talk a lot about taking care of yourself i talk about my sobriety um that part has stayed but um in terms of exercising even like the diet that i try to have on tour where i try to eat like super super clean so i can feel really really good i try to have as consistent of a sleep schedule as possible on the road um it's really, really dialed in on the road because, again, there's just such this clear purpose and I have to rise to the occasion. And it's super, super, super important to me. Um, it feels like life or death level of importance, which is intense. But that's literally how it feels inside of me um, to rise to the occasion and rock the show. And if I feel like I'm not doing everything I can to show up my best, um, it doesn't it doesn't work for me. So uh, that's another tough part about getting home is I kind of fall off the routines and I'm like, oh, I don't know. What does it matter? I don't have to perform. I, I, you know, what am I even supposed to be doing? Um, and I think that plays into some of the mental health stuff as well. So good news is started working out again yesterday. Worked out again today. We two for two, baby. <laughs> and uh, I'm also getting back to eating the way I like to eat. And uh, everything's kind of coming back to where it's supposed to be. And I do think, you know, it's okay to have little mini vacations from, you know, the fully optimized lifestyle. And that might be controversial to some people who say fully optimized every day, you know, go hard every single day. And hey, respect. Um, I, I feel that way most of the time. But I'm also going easy on myself saying, hey, you know what? It's okay, man. You did this massive tour. Um, you're home now. You can, uh, it's okay if the routines fell off a little bit for, uh, for a little while, but we're back to them now. With cardio and vocal warm-ups and stuff while on tour, is that yeah. something you had to learn the hard way? Or how did you uh, kind of establish your tour yeah. regimen? Um, yeah, it's in general, it's all stuff that I had to learn the hard way. It started with the voice. That was the, that was the biggest sort of um, 
like that was my Achilles heel was losing my voice. And actually back in the day, I would always lose my voice when I performed. Um, and you know, I was usually like, you know, we'd be drinking before smoking weed, whatever. So like, obviously that doesn't help. Like the smoke is actually like hit my throat moments before I hit the stage. But yeah, more so than that, I, I didn't know how to breathe correctly. Excuse me. And like I said, I would just go out there and, and yell. So, um, I thought for a while, like I had a lot of doubts, you know, I was like, damn, is this going to be my Achilles heel? Like, am I just always going to be the rapper that can't get through a show without losing his voice? Um, and it's been gradual to sort of figure that out. And I'm in a much, much, much better space with it now. Like universes away from where I used to be, but it has been gradual, even on the energy exchange tour, like basically for the last couple songs of the set, I was always very crispy in my vocals, like where it was like, okay, yeah, like obviously this voice has been used up and, and you know, that's cool. It's the last couple songs of the set that has a certain vibe to it too. Cause like I said, I always try to give my all and leave it all on the stage. But, um, I was actually really, that's one of the things that I'm most proud of. If I'm being honest for the Odyssey tour was, um, you know, I really leveled up, I think in terms of vocal control and I was able to get through to the end of most of those sets with encore and feel like I still had some gas left for the most part, um, in my voice. And you know, it, it still fluctuates like day to day, you know, like the body is a complicated organism, you know, and it's a lot of interconnected things doing all kinds of crazy shit in there. Uh, or so I'm told. So, um, you know, one day the voice is, is strong. The next day the voice might be a little weaker. So there's always fluctuation there, but, um, yeah, I definitely had to learn the hard way to take care of my voice. Cause like I said, it feels like life or death to me. Like that's how seriously I take, um, being an artist and especially being like a live performer. Um, I just can never allow myself to not bring it 110%. And so at the times when I would lose my voice, especially if I lost my voice earlier on, you know, and then I, and then, you know, you're kind of in survival mode for like a decent chunk of the set. Um, that used to happen all the time and it always made me feel terrible. Um, and so when did that happen? Like what's one of those memories that you recall where you lost it and it stands out to you? Um, it's gotta be tough. Uh, a time when I lost my voice. Well, I mean, it used to happen at the end of pretty much every set. It, it would happen a lot in college when I was performing with my band. Um, I think when I opened up for the far side, I lost my voice really bad for the last song. Oh, one time I did this high times festival actually. And I lost my voice really bad for like the last, I still had like 20 minutes to go in the set. And I remember like the end of every line, my voice was just like cracking up. So it was just, and like, I couldn't stop it. So it was just like flowing off the top of the dough every time around I'll be in my And there was, the, there was hardly anybody in the audience because I think it rained that day or something. And I guess, I don't know, I guess it, it wasn't that popping. But um, there was this girl like with her, with her man, like up at the front, like a couple. And the first time it happened, the girl looked at her man no. and like laughed. And then like he was still like looking up at me. And then she looked back at me. And then it happened a second time. But she like covered her mouth and laughed and looked back at him. And I was like, oh, no, dude, this is terrible. Um, so, yeah, that was a rough one, man. That's tough. Yeah. No matter how hard the bar is, it's hard to accentuate it with a voice crack. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, let's see what we got next right here. From 319 JMP, they, they're asking, what can you improve on skill-wise? Great question. What is a skill within the domain of freestyle rap that you either haven't tried or haven't mastered, but plan to? Um, great question. Well, there's a lot of things that I can improve on uh, skill wise. Pretty much everything could be improved on um, because music is a lifelong pursuit. So I'm always practicing. And I will say before I dive in on maybe some like theoretical things that would be cool to master. Uh, I'm huge on foundational stuff and I'm huge on practicing the basics. Um, you know, I, uh, there's actually, I, I heard, uh, there's a, a great drummer named Tommy, uh, Tommy Igo, who I heard, uh, say this the other day in a video where he was talking about like the basic, um, drum beat, um, like the, uh, the beat from Billie Jean where, you know, it's just booms, pats, booms, pats, booms, pats, but that drum beat is on like you know, thousands, tens of thousands of recordings. It's like the most basic beat. And it's usually the first beat that you use as a drummer. And he was talking about sometimes he'll have students who are more advanced that come and start studying with him. And he'll be like, all right, let me hear that beat, you know, that basic beat. 
And they'll be like, oh, no, no, man, like I'm so far past that. And he says, you just showed me that you're not. And that resonates with me so much because it's infinite, the level of depth that you can get into even with the most basic beat, like the milliseconds of where you place the kick drum relative to the hi-hat, the milliseconds of how the snare is aligning with the hi-hat and how all the parts come together to create that feel. Um, If it was that easy, like you just learn it and now you check it off and now you got it, then, um, you know, everybody would be able to make it feel as good as it feels on any of the classic records that we hear it on. Um, but, But that's not the case, right? So for me, I'm just all about like, drilling the basics i've talked a lot of times about like the setup punchline technique that i use which is basically just flipping it um if you get thrown a word while you're freestyling don't say the word first say it second right and say a rhyming word with it first um so if the word is hand don't say i got the mic in my hand now i'm about to do a freestyle that's unplanned just reverse that off the top do a freestyle that's unplanned you know i crush it when i got the mic in my hand um that's kind of like one of the most foundational techniques uh, for freestyling off top, in my opinion. And I still practice that in its basic form, um, pretty much every day. And when I practice it now, it's about like, how deep can I go with it? So, you know, can I get rid of any semblance of a filler phrase, you know, like, obviously, can I not say, Hey, yo, it's Harry Mack. Like I used to say all the time, but even beyond that, can I not say, um, any of the other filler phrases that I use, or even can I not say, uh, yeah, at the beginning of the couplet, but just make it flow completely smoothly, almost sounds like I wrote it, right? So I'm big on that. I'm always trying to go deeper and deeper with the basics. That's just one example. Um, But in terms of uh, other like domains and things to master, I mean, I still feel like I have a a long way to go uh, in terms of like attacking a topic, you know, or a subject in depth. And uh, the cool thing is I get to practice that a lot live. A big part of our live show is you know, not just getting a, a influx of random words, but actually like taking a singular topic, like one that comes to mind um, in Amsterdam was for the love of the game, you know, so the suggestion is for the love of the game. And and then it's about me taking that and, you know, creating a hook and then creating this like three verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, song structure, all surrounding this random suggestion that I've just seen of for the love of the game. So I get to practice that a lot on tour, sort of like peeling back the layers of a concept and and creating uh not just like an extended freestyle verse but an actual song structure um with a hook that comes back that the crowd can yell out with me something catchy hopefully that we can all learn quickly and get on the same page with i feel like i'm just scratching the surface of that if i'm being honest and that there's actually a lot more depth that i could bring to that and a lot more different ways that that i could attack it you know um there's so many different ways to tell a story and and get a theme across you know if the if the subject was for the love of the game right what i did in amsterdam was i kind of said this like i was saying what it's not for you know it was like a negative so that the chorus could be the positive so it was like not because i want to have diamonds in the chain not because i want to leave the rapper slain not because and it was all that not because i want to get money by the stack not because I want to prove these other cats are whack, not so I can, you know, and all and on, on and on and on, all these things that are not why I do it. And then when the hook came around, it was like, I'm doing all this just because it's for the love of the game, love of the game, right? So that was how I happened to approach that. But there's a million other ways I could have done it too. Like, what if it started with a narrative? What if it started with like a story about somebody? Like he's sitting in his room late at night, The lights are off. Now he's got his pen to write. He's sitting there frustrated, can't find the word. He wants to spit lyrics that are crazy and absurd. Wants to be like his idols he listens to all the time, but can't seem to find the first word for the rhyme. What he does have is passion building in his heart. But can he start to scratch the letters for his art? The first word emerges and then go on from there and then tell the story of like a young kid that's developing this love of the game. And that the reason that they sat there and pushed through the frustration was because they had a deep love for the game. Right. And then and then. These are just two out of, you know, an infinite number of possibilities in terms of ways to attack a subject for an improvised song. So I feel like there's a lot more to explore there. Um, And I I also feel like rhythmically, there's a whole world of possibilities that is still out there for me to explore and get comfortable with. Obviously, rhythm, like I said, rhythm is kind of my angle. And the, the thing that draws me to music above anything else is rhythmic improvisation. And as a drummer, I definitely feel like, um, 
you know, I have a huge sort of, uh, th that's incredibly helpful, you know, for me to have been a professional jazz drummer for so long. It definitely gives me an advantage rhythmically, but, um, you know, there's, there's odd time signatures, rapping in 5-8, eight, 7-8, eight, that could be cool to explore, or just rhythmic things that I might do on the drums that I haven't yet considered doing as a freestyler that I'd like to be able to apply. Um, and yeah, a lot of other things too. I think melody, I could go a lot further with melody as well, because I'm not really a singer. I'm much more of a rapper. I'm like a tiny bit of a singer, 99% rapper, 1% singer, if that. Um, but I do try to add melodies into what I'm doing, and that's something I'm kind of working on as well. Um, those are a few things off top. One more thing I'll mention too is rather than just a singular song, it could be interesting to do a longer structure. You know, like if you imagine like the ultimate presentation would be like a freestyle opera, like the whole show is like one, you know, one continuous through line, you know? Um, I don't know, but like dialing it back from there, what if just three songs in a row told an extended story, you know, beginning, middle and end, like that could be amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's always room to grow. I improvise everything, but a lot of my biggest heroes, you know, sit there and write and, and create um, beautiful works of art from, uh, you know, having having all the time in the world available to them to craft it perfectly. And so I'm, I'm comparing my freestyles to that, you know. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'll, I'll never I'll never stop learning and growing. And there's always a, a wide gap to uh, to be filled. And I'm just loving the process of learning and continuing to grow as I go. That's dope. Hell yeah. Where do you like find the drills and practice avenues for these things that you've worked on? I know you've uh, used random word generator all the time and stuff yeah. like that. Are there any out there that you know of that you haven't attempted yourself yet, like in terms of growing your freestyle skills? Um, not really, because I, I basically make up my own exercises for for freestyling. So yeah. Um, I think that's one of the one of the biggest gifts I got from learning to play the drums, and before that, learning to play the violin, which was my first instrument. Um, my teachers who were really great and I'm really grateful for in Portland where I'm from, um, they, they taught me above anything else how to practice. And so, you know, to me, practice is just identifying something that you need to improve at and then making a, a exercise, which is really like a game, right? It's like reverse engineering a game that will help you focus on that exact facet of what you're doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I basically made up all of the exercises that I used to improve it at, at uh, freestyling. But um, I don't know of like a, a standard resource that has like right. freestyle exercises because there's no real curriculum. You know, um, freestyling is traditionally self-taught and to this day still self-taught. But I'm excited to have this podcast so I can, you know, share more techniques and actually let me know in the comments um, if you guys would like to hear more sort of like nitty gritty stuff on the uh, the actual technique of freestyling. Shout out to Rick Glassman, by the way, because we got into some real, real nitty gritty uh, freestyle mechanics on his podcast. And I was loving it, loving it. And he actually had me thinking about things in a way that I hadn't ever thought about them before, which is always the best part about teaching is, you know, the student will um, challenge the teacher to consider things from an angle that they've never considered them before. So, um, yeah, let me know if y'all want more uh, more game on the techniques, man. I know we got a lot of young freestylers out there on the grind, so I'd be happy to share some more info on that. Yeah, yeah. We got another one here that kind of touches on the uh, name of the pod. Uh, Hell yeah. I'll jump into this one if you're up for it. Yes, let's get it. Julius Ar Archlock. <laughs> Julius Archlock. I might be saying that wrong. Julius. <laughs> what up, Julius? Hope you're doing well. The question is, flow state, how to achieve it? Do you also enter the flow state in other situations? How does it feel for you while freestyling? Do emotions play a role in what you come up with? These are fantastic questions. Um, for the longest time, I didn't know uh, how to achieve it necessarily. Um, I didn't know anything about it. I just knew that at a certain point in my progress as a, as a young freestyler, after I'd been working at it for, I guess, at least four or five years, you know, if not longer, I arrived at a, at a place where I had enough technique to where when I started freestyling, I could just fully lose myself in the act of freestyling. And uh, it's like, you know, being in the zone. And it's like, you know, you totally lose track of time. You forget where you are even. Um, you know, it's like this thing where, you know, sometimes I would like end up doing this like seven minute verse and not realize it. And then like suddenly my head comes out of it. And I'm like, oh my God, like, where am I? And what's happening right now? Um, 
So it was just something that uh, started happening to me when I would freestyle and it was so addictive. Um, I just loved that feeling and still love that feeling to this day. And I've said before, and I think it's true, I think a big part of the reason why I've been able to put so much time and energy into the craft of learning how to freestyle is because freestyling is like an access point for me to get into that flow state. Uh, and I feel like it happens to a degree almost like every time, you know, and there's levels to it for sure. Like there's the, the times when you're fully tranced out and you're just completely in it and there's nothing else happening in your mind. But even, even short of that, I enter a level of flow almost every time that I start rapping, you know? Um, and I think, you know, uh, for me, what's so cool about freestyling is it's, it's to this day, it's incredibly challenging, right? Um, even the basic techniques are still challenging in their own way and certainly the more advanced things that i'm attempting are even more challenging and you know come to find later as i started learning more about flow state and like people who have actually studied flow state and and kind of know how it works um sort of the, the key ingredient is you have to be doing something that's sort of at the edge of your ability right so if something is too challenging, like it's way beyond your ability, then you're just going to be overwhelmed and stressed and you won't be able to enter flow state because of that. On the other hand, if something is way too easy, then uh, you're going to be bored and you're going to get distracted and it's not going to demand your full focus. So what's so cool about improvising as a musician uh, and for me freestyling is that um, it remains challenging all the time. I'm able to add more layers of complexity once I figure out a certain skill and get it down. Um, and so it, it always remains just challenging enough to where I can sort of work right at the edge of my ability and just be completely immersed and completely focused on what I'm doing. And um, it's such a beautiful thing, man. I love it. And you asked, you know, if I enter flow state in other situations, I'm sure I probably do, but none nearly as consistently as freestyling. To me, it's like one in the same. It's like flow state is freestyling. And I think it's so dope that, you know, kicking a rhyme is like, it's called flowing, you know, it's like, I'm a bust of flow. Um, it makes so much sense. You know, um, rapping is flowing. It's flowing over a beat. And when I'm freestyling, I'm, I'm flowing through my life. So um, it's really, really beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. And then you also asked, I wanted to touch on this because this is interesting. Do emotions play a role in what you come up with? Absolutely. Absolutely. Emotions play a role in what I come up with. Um, one of the things I love most about freestyling is that it keeps you honest um, because there's no time to adjust your message or filter what you're saying. Like you can't think of what you're going to say next and then also have the thought of like, oh, I don't want to say that because of X, Y, Z or that doesn't align with the person that I'm trying to portray. So I'm not going to say that. It's like it's all just flowing out, you know. And so um, the only way to do it successfully is to fully commit to whatever idea comes to you in the moment. And so um, depending on where I'm at in my life, how I'm feeling emotionally, um, you know, that's going to dictate sort of the tonality and the themes that are coming out when I'm freestyling. And they're just going to flow out in this really organic way, kind of with no filter. And the cool thing is because of that, I've actually learned a lot about myself through the act of freestyling. And especially now that we actually like record so many of my freestyles back in the day, every freestyle I ever spit just immediately dissipated into the cosmos, never to be heard again. But now it's so hours and hours and hours of me freestyling have been documented and you can watch them and I can watch them. And I've actually, I think I've gained a lot more self-awareness, uh, which is another lifelong journey. So I'm still not nearly as self-aware as I want to be. And I guess it's self-aware to notice that I'm not <laughs> as self-aware as I want to be. But uh, I have learned a lot about myself through freestyling and it cues me into where I'm at emotionally which is really dope it's like a little radar system that it's like hey man you're feeling this way it's like damn i guess i am feeling that way i didn't really realize it until i got into the flow state and my subconscious started speaking for me i think like one example of emotions playing an impact on the content like at the beginning of um the pandemic obviously an emotional time for everybody and for me like that's when i decided that i didn't want to you know drink alcohol or, or or smoke weed anymore so i like became sober at the beginning of the pandemic and the thing that's challenging about that is like you're so raw emotionally because you're so used to like utilizing these sort of like substances to not have to really like check in with your emotions that much. And they can kind of like mask your emotions in the way you really feel. So it was like this 
compounding thing of like the world is in chaos. There's so much uncertainty. Everybody's stressed because of the pandemic and us not knowing what that really means. And then on top of that, it's like, of course, that's when I decide that I, <laughs> I want to try to become sober. So there were a lot of emotions. And I just remember, like, I started doing the live streams really consistently, like twice a week and and uh, making that content. And uh, even with Amigo Bars starting up and connecting with people who, you know, didn't have other ways of connecting with humans other than the Internet and places like Amigo. And when I like go back and listen to a lot of the content, like so many raw emotions are kind of coming through um, the the music in, in ways that I hadn't been able to access previously. So, um, yeah, wherever I'm at, man, it's going to come out in the freestyle. Freestyling keeps you honest. You can't really fake it. So, uh, you know, that's just, dope. Yeah. A lot of people ask or enjoy, at least in your freestyles, you, uh, you know, kind of giving us access, you being vulnerable, you being genuine. Yeah. And so flow state has a big, uh, you know, reason behind that. There's just, yeah, there's no, there's no hiding. Basically, there's no time. Yeah. Is that is that kind of why you're able to access those regions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's a straight. Uh, like I said, it's like the subconscious. You know, you you enter that flow state, and it's not it's not like I'm thinking like, oh, I should say this. That'd be good. Right. It's more like I'm listening while the. Um, ideally, it's like I'm listening while the material is coming out of me, almost like somebody else is doing the rhyme. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and and there's no time to edit. You know, that's the thing is that you you can't. If you're writing a rhyme, you could do the first line and be like, oh, it's kind of whack, you know, scratch it out, try something else. Oh, I don't want to say that because then if I say that, everyone's going to think this. All right, let me not say that. And then at the end of the day, like, um, you can kind of create whatever persona you want to present um, as an artist, which I think that's dope, you know. And and by the way, like I said before, I'm a huge fan of all the great writers in hip hop. Um, huge fan of, you know, Kendrick Lamar, huge fan of Nas, obviously, and, and all the greats who who um, preconceive and, and write their lyrics. Um, but uh, yeah, for me, I just love that freestyling. It's, it's almost like I can't access the emotional content unless I'm freestyling. It's like, I don't know how to rap until I start rapping or I don't know where I'm at emotionally until I start flowing. So um, yeah, that's why I love it. That's awesome, man. Hell yeah. We got a bunch more questions here. Um, and then we also have like some freestyles that people sent in. Hell yeah. So maybe like one more, one more question, question then dive into some. I dope, love it. Dope. All right. Let's yep. pull up one more, which let's is from yeah. MJDW9MO. Hell yeah. A robot from the future has submitted <laughs> this question. MJDW9MO. Um, shout out to you. Thank you for this question. How has the journey differed slash surprised slash confirmed from what you assumed it would be how has the journey differed surprised or confirmed what you assumed it would be hmm great question um it's i think that for me it's interesting because you know i was born with this sort of like rhythmic feeling inside my body and i knew that i needed to express it physically so that, that's always been there and the attraction to music has always been there um, since I was a baby. So I don't know how that works, you know, like the neurological and the DNA and everything that like leads to that being the case. But that's how my experience has felt for as far back as I can remember. And even before I could remember from stories relayed to me by my parents and family members. Um, there's always been that. I've always thought music was the coolest shit ever. I'll never forget the first time that I was at a music store and I was so young that I was reaching up to hold my dad's hand. And there was a drum set there and I immediately started walking up to it and the, the store owner noticed and he said, put your foot on that pedal, see what happens. And I put my tiny little foot and my tiny little shoe on the bass drum pedal and my dad had to push me down because I didn't have enough leg strength to push, push it. And the bass drum beater flew into the bass drum head and it went and it like vibrated my existence and I was like, that's the feeling. That's the electric rhythm. That's what I want to do. So... Um, always had like such a draw to music and because of that i've known um basically my whole life that i wanted to do music and be a musician and as soon as i was able to sort of like conceptualize that it was possible to like make your career as a musician and be you know have that be the thing that you commit your life to um i i wanted to do that um when was that i mean i don't know that's a good question i guess like 
Well, the first time I had to really deal with that thought of like, what do you want to do with your, you know, with your life, like as a, as a professional, so to speak, or like, how do you want to try to make your living was when I was like, you know, a junior in high school or something like that. And then it was like, oh, I got to get ready to apply to colleges. And now I got to decide like, what's my degree program going to be at the beginning, you know? And the funny thing is that that's the first time that I ever had to think about what my career would be really. Cause as a kid, you're just flowing, you know, you're just going through life. You're just doing whatever seems fun. And, and, you know, um, whatever you're drawn to, you just do it. Cause it doesn't really matter. Your parents are, are funding your entire existence. Uh, but that was the first time where it was like, okay, you got to make an important decision about where you want to go. Ironically though, that's the only time where I ever second guessed it at all. Um, and I, I don't think I really second guessed it in my heart. I just second guessed it in my brain. It's that whole thing I was talking about, about not following the intuition and overthinking things and getting in your own way. And you know, the story around becoming a professional musician is like, uh, wow, like, you know, get ready to be a starving artist. You know, like, I hope you, I hope you like ramen noodles. Um, it's going to be really, really tough. You better have a plan B. Most people don't make it. Um, and all of that is true. Like it is true. It's like super competitive and most people don't make it. And you have to be so, so, so undeniably exceptional to even have a chance to maybe possibly make it if the timing's right. And uh, all of that is correct. But anybody that is a creative in any way or an entrepreneur or anybody that has, you know, attempted to pave their own path will tell you that even though it's completely irrational, um, if it's your calling, then you absolutely have to go forward and give everything you can to it because otherwise you're going to regret not doing that. But, um, yeah, I guess I was like a junior in high school and it was like, you know, okay, like Harry, what do you think you want to do, you know, for college, for your degree? And I was like, yeah, well, you know, there's music and I kind of like really love that <laughs> more than anything, but like, I also like writing. So like, I don't know, maybe I'll do like journalism or creative writing or something like that. So, I was like for a couple weeks between music and writing and uh, sometimes it's hard for me to make decisions. It's, it's one of my shortcomings, you know, I, cause I do have a tendency to overthink things. Um, and my parents were like, okay, well I guess I take a couple weeks and think on it. And I just remember after like a couple weeks passed, I was like, nah, I want to do music full time. Let's go. Let's rock. And luckily my parents supported it because that's not the case for a lot of people. I mean, it's hard enough to try to pursue a creative path when you have the full support of your family. A lot of people are like, their parents are like, you're either going to become a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer and that's it. And like, don't tell me any of this other BS about, oh, you want to be a musician. That'll never happen. You have to make money. And they still have to uh, find a way to push back against that to follow their calling. So luckily I didn't have to really deal with that. Um... But yeah, I've always known since then, I guess, or since before then, that I wanted to be a musician full time. And, and I always knew at the end of the day, no matter what I had to do to make money, that I would be a musician, you know, because it's always felt to me like inside my body that I am a musician um, from before I even knew how to play. I was already a musician, you know, um, so that feeling has always been really strong. But I think to answer your question, to bring it back, you know, you know, you're asking how the journey differed from or surprised or confirmed what I assumed it would be. It actually did all of the above. It confirmed um, that music was the path for me. And it confirmed that in a way that's even like bigger and grander than I probably could have imagined. You know, I was just trying to hopefully like survive playing music, you know, it's like, oh, can I like pay my rent and pay my bills and like buy groceries and, and live however modest I have to live? Like, can I at least live and not have to do a job that I don't care about and actually hate doing? Can I actually do what I love and survive? And now, you know, I'm in this place where I get to go on these tours and, and I have all these fans around the world and, and, um, you know, I'm not Drake, <laughs> but I'm out here doing it in, in, a, in a big way, you know, and, uh, and I'm really proud of that. And, and it, it feels amazing. And, um, you know, that has confirmed what I've always known, that music was the path for me. But in almost every other way, it has differed from and surprised me. It has differed from what I thought it would be. And it has surprised me. You know, for a long time, I thought that I was going to be a professional drummer, that that was going to be the main way um, that I would earn my living was playing jazz gigs. Um, you know, and, and it never really... I think in all creative pursuits, the way you think it's going to pan out is usually not how it pans out. It goes some other path. And I think the sort of, for me anyway, like the key to success has been not fighting the path that it naturally takes. You know, like there was a time where I was like, oh, I want to be, you know, 
Nas, Jay-Z. Like, I want to be like that. I want to have platinum plaques hanging on my walls from like big singles that go to radio and I'll drop an album every year and everyone will be a classic and tell, a, you know, this narrative arc, you know, through the course of my albums, you know, or like, like Kendrick Lamar, you know, has done so skillfully, you know, where every second of everything he creates matters as part of a bigger picture. You know, I thought maybe that that's what I wanted to do, you know, and then what has ended up happening is I'm somebody who has freestyled <laughs> millions upon millions of bars in, in hours upon hours of content, video content, mostly for the internet, you know? So that's a lot different than dropping an album every year and hanging the platinum plaques. You know, I, um, drop content every day <laughs> and, uh, and I have the YouTube plaque, you know? So, okay, that's the path for Harry Mack. And, you know, if I, in the beginning, I would maybe try to fight that, you know, like way back in 2016, 2017, when it was first starting, it was like, wait, this isn't it. Like, it's not videos for YouTube. It's like songs to the radio and albums to the Rolling Stone greatest albums of all time list. And, uh, if it, and, and so I would try to fight it and that would always mess things up, you know, and it, it really, it was gradual, but it took me sort of like accepting and saying like, wait a second, that was never my path anyway. That was Jay-Z's path or that was Kendrick Lamar's path, you know, and, and to be sure their path is a lot different than like the path that like, I'm sure like Tupac was on, you know, or, or the cats before them. So, um, everybody has their own unique path. And, and through accepting that, uh, I've been able to really enjoy, like how beautiful it is to have my own unique journey um, through the game. And it's surprising all the time. And even still, whatever I think is going to be um, like, oh, this is the direction I'm headed. It's probably not actually going to go right that way that I think it's going to go. It's going to take some kind of turn. It's going to fork, you know, and it's going to end up being something different that I never could have imagined. And uh, for me, it's just about realizing that, you know what, it's going to be better than I ever could have imagined as long as I'm, I'm willing to accept it and embrace it and, um, so that's the tip that I'm on, man. Hell yeah. Yeah. Not fighting it, just kind of taking it. Not fighting it, man, because, yeah, you, you miss out on all the cool things about your own journey that could only be your journey if you're always comparing your journey to somebody else, yeah. you know? And I just think in general that whole comparison thing, like, you know, it's it's said so often now that it feels like a cliche, but it's like, you know, comparison is, is like the worst thing for your happiness. You know, it gets in the way of your happiness. Um, and so – yeah, you know, all all of the heroes that I look up to are who they are because they went their own way. And so to take inspiration from them is not to try to do what they did. To take inspiration from them is to say they went their own way and made something for themselves that nobody else could have done. So I'm going to make my own way and go my own path and do something that nobody else could have done. So here we are. Nice. <laughs> and it all arrives at Flow State Podcast, episode one, baby. That's right. That's right. Uh, anybody who wants to send questions in, hit up harrymacofficial.com slash flow state pod. Yes. Uh, now to flip this script once more. People yes. have been reacting to your freestyles. Indeed. For uh, quite some time now. Yes. And I don't know if I've ever seen you react to anybody else's uh, like that. So yes. uh, shall we? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Shout out to everybody that submitted their freestyles. We asked y'all to, uh, to send some through the email. And so, uh, for all the young freestylers out there, by the way, I think this is going to be something that we'll do again and again in the future, uh, might make this a recurring part of the podcast. So if you have a, uh, desire to, uh, get some feedback from me on your freestyles, just send a video 60 seconds or less to Yo, what's going on, everybody? It is me, Harry Mack, reporting to you from a completely different studio. This podcast is growing so fast that um, the process I gave in the original recording is no longer correct. So the way that you can submit questions and or freestyles for me to answer and or react to, respectively, is by going to harrymacofficial.com backslash or, or forward slash, anyway, harrymacofficial.com slash flowstatepod. harrymacofficial.com slash flowstatepod. Hit me with your questions. Send me your freestyles. Let's have some fun, y'all. All right, back to it. All right, so we got one here from Eric. All right. Uh, looks like Eric has uh, three words up here, something you're familiar with. Yes, uh, random word generator. Let's go. Let's get it. Dope. Canvas, soul, and pitch. Yeah. 
I spit this shit this damn lit I hope they understand this I'm like a beautiful picture up on the canvas I never rip in the garbage I get it started Said I'm pretty like the picture that be painted by an artist Yeah, beautiful up every time I'm getting musical I'm loose with those flows So I be dropping and they knew it though I'm a killer man, it's off of the brain It's insane, I got the canvas, put it up in the frame It's on the wall, every lyric I kick fully evolved Every time I'm on the microphone, you'll know up the star Losing control, never gon' fold I hold mic and then I get gold And rip these lyrics straight from my soul Yeah, I told you I'ma kick it loudly till they hear it Said I'm rockin' rhymes from my soul Pullin' from my spirit, ay, do this for myself ay, No, it's not about nothing else Said it's all just for my spiritual health I lift it up, get me higher ay, Know that my desire is just pull up on the microphone Spit it into inspire people when I'm rapping. Yeah, taking this in action Rap smashing every time I do this I'm Attracting everybody, man, feeling like my soul is rich I come and rock up on the mic, I increase my pitch Yeah, rhythm, I'm kicking it live, rhyme with my vision I increase my pitch, my harmony, all intuition Yeah, trust in myself, man, I trust in my gut I'll increase up on my octave when I'm doing enough Yeah, changing Woo! I need my <laughs> buttons for the po- That's one thing we need for the podcast, I need my buttons I forgot to set that up Uh, That was dope, man Shout out to Eric. Shout out to Eric. That was like really dope. I didn't know what to expect um, with the with the freestyles that were submitted. We only posted that people should submit yesterday, so we didn't even know if we were going to get any. Um, that was fire, man. Shout out to Eric, wherever you're at, man. Uh, so much dope stuff with that, like right off the rip. Hey, I think it's dope that you're using the random word generator, um, which is a tool that I use all the time to practice as well, and, uh, and taking the three words and expanding on them. First thing, the recording sounded fire. Uh, you got a good setup. Second thing, your voice sounds really good, and the flow and the rhythm, like the whole tonality of it um, just sounded really on point. Like if, if somebody started playing that, uh, I wouldn't be like, oh, it, it didn't. It didn't sound like amateur or jarring in any way. Like it sounded, um, it sounded really solid. Um, and then I obviously love that you're improvising off the three words. I love that you're scheming on the three words, which is what I like to do as well. So you didn't just do like one bar about canvas and then a bunch of random bars about rapping and then one bar about soul and a bunch of random bars. It was like you did a bar about canvas and then a bar about art and the paint and the hanging on the wall and you know the soul to the spirit. And what I really liked too was going from soul to pitch. You combined them because you were like feeling like my soul is rich. Something, something, something. I'm increasing the pitch. I can't remember exactly what you said, but I thought that connection between soul and pitch um, was amazing. So. Um, yeah, bro, you killed that, man. The only thing I would say um, is uh, because I know you're you're improvising and doing it off top. I would hit the uh, randomize because I didn't actually see you hit the randomize button. Well, it starts with this. Actually, oh, there shit. is like a half a second. I just got that, and then right at the beginning, yeah, it starts Wait, with run that, that again, and he switches right there. You Never see mind. That? Pause it. Pause yeah, it. Yeah. Choo, 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 choo. <laughs> That's fire, uh, dude. You destroyed that, man. That is epic. Uh, high level of freestyling, man. To not only be able to do the setup punchline in the pocket uh, with a dope flow and, and dope rhythm and a dope voice, but to actually be able to scheme out on the words like that and connect them thematically, like... <laughs> dude, yeah, I, I, I really... I mean... You need that air horn. I don't have much to say, bro. I think, like, you are well on your way. You, you're, you're already on your path, and you're already um, dealing with a lot of advanced shit, man. Like, just to be able to do that... Um, I don't know how long you've been doing it, man, but to, to be able to do what you just did took me years, years and years. And I mean, it took me like more than 10 years. So, um, I'd be curious to know when you started rapping, if you see this video, leave a comment and, uh, let us know. We won't be able to confirm that it's you. So we might have like 10 errors being like, yeah, that's me. I've been doing it for two, two weeks. Uh, but, uh, nah, man, amazing. Super yeah. dope. Shout out, Eric. Thanks Shout for sending that in. Hell yeah. Sick. Thank you, bro. Keep going, man. Cause yeah, you already... You're already well on your way, man. That's fire. I spent years just trying to figure out how to do a clean setup punchline with just the word that was given to me. Um, so, you know, I didn't even try to like expand on it thematically that much uh, where I was like making a concerted effort to do that every time until a lot later. So uh, it's dope to see people coming up now that are like jumping to that point, I think a lot faster, you know, um, than, than, than it came to me. So that's dope. And that's a big part of the reason why I want, like, I'm excited to put this content out. 
Um, because, you know, I was able to learn so much from the freestylers that came before me from checking them out and, and seeing how they put things together. And, um, that's like a huge blessing and it helps so much, you know, to, to have these like recordings that you can refer to. And so it's cool that now like that I'm putting more content out, people are able to refer to that and, and hopefully learn a few things from, from checking it out. And, and if it helps people, you know, get really, really dope at freestyling at a faster rate, like to me, that's a beautiful thing, you know, um, you should you shouldn't have to take 10 years to figure out how to do some of these things um you can get there a little quicker maybe if, if there's more examples of people doing it so man i think back fondly on all the ciphers that we had up in uh brady's attic i call it an attic it was really just his upstairs <laughs> um but i'm gonna keep calling it an attic but yeah up, up in brady's attic man we had so many ciphers after school for hours and hours and hours um and i i was just thinking about those the other day and and how cool they were and it was so hot up in there and we're dripping in sweat and we got the incense lit you know to cover up the bong smell you know because his parents are downstairs and we're just going in and and no cameras you know that's what's so crazy about all that is uh it was just like for the love of the game you know it was just for the love of the game and, and we were obsessed with it but um man that's super dope that's super dope. Thank you to the uh, to the MCs that sent those videos in. Whew. Don't be discouraged if you're earlier on in your freestyle journey too. Um, you know, if you're just getting started or whatever, feel free to send something through and and uh, you know I, I'll, I'll check it out and and uh, maybe give some feedback. Um, so uh, yeah, if you if you want the opportunity to potentially have your freestyle seen on the pod, um, just send me a video, 60 seconds or less. So with that, I'm feeling inspired, man. I think it's time for me to close this thing out the way I know how. Um, I'm not going to make y'all watch a whole podcast with me and not kick at least a few <laughs> bars. So we're going to close this thing out with a freestyle. I don't have anything planned. I'm not going to use a word generator or, or have anything thrown to me. Maybe I'll just, um, I'm, I'm thinking there's some good ideas floating around in my head, probably from everything we just discussed. So we'll see what comes. All right, let's get it. Let's get it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Off the top, I just let it flow, sign. This is Flow State Podcast, episode one. Never selling out, cause you know that I stay true. I gotta get the pod popping right from the debut. First episode, I'm speaking on my thoughts, on my ideas, and the energy I brought. Yeah, you know I ain't giving y'all the run round hard getting home from tour, cause that's a calm down. Hey yo, all those dope shows I'm remembering. So much travel that was fueled by adrenaline. Back home, and I wonder what my purpose is. Now I gotta sit down, record a verse that's lit I'm finally finding my foot and what can they tell me? Finally getting back to the routines that are healthy Finally eating how I'm supposed to eat Finally exercising so I got wind in my lungs when rocking these beats Bringing back the cardio to prove the Harry Mac too hard with flows Thinking you on the same level, I beg your pardon bro, we back at it The Max rapping over mad static I keep it passionate, instrumental, I'm smashing it Pedal to floor, I'm mashing it down and I'm going faster With all of these styles I'm kicking through, never Say Mac, we sick of you, run a trick or two I got a couple up my sleeve Ay, Kill it off the tip of this, y'all better believe We gon' show you how it goes when we get in live My first goal in music was simply to survive Yeah, and now I truly get to thrive But there's so many points on my journey I was surprised, I mean, it's no wonder Never been a bummer I thought at one time I'd make it as a jazz drummer I still got that electric rhythm in my veins But instead of drumsticks It just starts flowing out my brain Who'd have thought? And then I thought my flow would devolve To the point where I got platinum plashes hanging on my wall Thought my studio would look like Dr. Dre's Or maybe that of J to the Z Now it's crazy to see how I went my own path With mics that I freak I went my own journey cause my trail is unique And what I realized about the ones that idolize All the dope rappers like Nas who rock the mic so live Is they went their own path and blazed their own trail Did it their own way, that's why they don't fail So my inspiration from them is not simply to imitate my inspiration from them, I have to fucking innovate Change the game, make a lane for rappers on to come up Hopefully this energy inside that I summon Will help you get to the point where you can scheme In less than 10 years and truly follow your dream I'm trying to make it more possible and more realistic And break down the techniques in ways that are simplistic So everyone across the planet can do it gigantic And not have to face them fears and straight up panic A massive cipher through the virtual reality None can challenge me, y'all know like yin and yang these beats balance me, I keep it all in motion Freestyle God, I had to speak my thoughts for y'all Up on the pod, 
I had to make it known when I'm speaking my voice. Hopefully, Flow State Podcast, your number one choice. And y'all know I'm kicking all these freestyles right from the heart. We're going to be number one up on the podcast chart. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're going to wish it into existence now, nah, man. I don't know where we're going to be on the podcast chart, but hopefully we could be one of the podcasts that's in your heart. Thank y'all so much for watching this, man. Thank you so much for tapping in with me. I super appreciate y'all. Um, you know what it is, man. Flow State episode one. Hey, by the way, I'm doing this, like I said, to open up a little bit more and share some of my own ideas, but I also plan to get some dope guests on here as well, um, particularly while I'm catching my breath here from the freestyle. Woo! <laughs> Uh, particularly people who like me are really, really dedicated to their craft and, um, you know, people who are chasing that, uh, that, that high man, that flow state, people who are, who are, uh, equally addicted to that feeling of being in the zone. And, uh, as you know, you know, there's a, there's a certain thresh, threshold of skill you have to hit before you can really enter that zone and enter that flow state. And I want to get some of those people on here and talk to them because I want to learn from them. And, uh, you know, I want to include you all in that journey as well. So we can all learn together and uh, pick some people's brains. So uh, let me know in the comments, you know, who you'd like to see on here as a guest, if there's anyone in particular that you want to see on here. And uh, yeah, man, give, give me all the feedback uh, in the comments. Let me know how y'all are feeling. Thank you so, so much for being here. None of this is possible without you. Thank you for watching. Um, and we'll see y'all next time. Much love.